Hi, and welcome back to my videos for General Chemistry 1. Today I want to tell you about a couple more properties of atoms, including one that's important when we're designing lasers that we can use in surgery and in a lot of other applications too. To get there, let's start by remembering that in the last video, we said that the periodic table can help us predict trends in some properties of atoms. We mentioned four of those properties, the atomic radius, the ionization energy, the electron affinity, and the electronegativity. Last time we talked about the atomic radius, and we'll talk about the next two today. So first, we'll talk about the ionization energy. As we've mentioned before, we can form a positively charged ion by removing an electron from an atom. So, for example, if we have a lithium atom, we can make a lithium plus ion by removing an electron. It takes a certain amount of energy to do that, Remember, the electron has a negative charge, so it's attracted to the positive nucleus of the atom, so removing the electron takes effort. The process of removing the electron is called ionization, so the energy it takes to remove the electron is called the ionization energy. Some elements are easier to ionize than others, so each element has a different ionization energy, and we can use the periodic table to predict which elements have a higher ionization energy than others. As we saw last time, the radius of an ion increases as we go down a column of the periodic table. This is because as we go down, the value of n increases, which means the number of electron shells increases. As you might guess, the farther an electron is from the nucleus, the less strongly it's held by the nucleus. This means it's easier to take away from the atom, so the ionization energy is higher at the top of the periodic table. So for example, if we look at the atoms in this column, the ionization energy decreases from 800.6 kilojoules per mole for boron down to 704.9 kilojoules per mole for nihonium. You might have noticed that although the ionization energy is indeed highest at the top of this column, the trend kind of falls apart near the bottom. Nihonium actually has a higher ionization energy than the atoms above it. Why is that? You'll talk more about it when you take a course in inorganic chemistry, but the short answer is, in the very large atoms at the bottom of the periodic table, the electrons move so quickly that they approach the speed of light. The theory of relativity tells us that electrons like that become heavier and also move closer to the nucleus. As a result, the atomic radius isn't as high as we might expect, so the valence electrons are closer to the nucleus and therefore harder to remove. That means the ionization energy is higher than expected in these atoms. In this class, you don't need to worry about the theory of relativity. It's still generally true that the ionization energy is higher at the top of the periodic table and lower at the bottom. But what about when we move from left to right? This time, to understand the change in the ionization energy, we need to think about the effective nuclear charge on the valence electrons. Take the second row of the periodic table, for example. Lithium has three protons, so its nucleus has a charge of plus three. However, as we found out in the last video, the two inner electrons shield some of this charge, so the valence electron only feels an effective nuclear charge of plus one. On the other hand, the nucleus of neon has ten protons, so it has a charge of plus ten. But the valence electrons are shielded by the two electrons closer to the nucleus, so they only feel an effective nuclear charge of plus eight. If we apply the same logic to all the atoms in this row, you can see that the effective nuclear charge increases as we go left to right. How does that affect the ionization energy? Well, as you might expect, the more the electron is attracted to the nucleus, the higher the ionization energy. So neon should have a higher ionization energy than lithium. And as you can see, this is the case. The ionization energy of lithium is 520.2 kilojoules per mole and it increases as we go right on the periodic table until we reach neon, which has an ionization energy of 2080.7 kilojoules per mole. So the ionization energy is higher as we go to the right on the periodic table and as we go up. Let's try an example. Suppose we have atoms of copernicium, bismuth, chlorine, actinium, 
and tellurium. Let's put these in order from smallest ionization energy to largest. The first thing we need to do is find each of these on the periodic table. So here are carbonaceum, bismuth, chlorine, actinium, and tellurium. Now that we've done that, we just need to remember that the ionization energy gets larger as we go up and to the right. So actinium is the smallest, then copernicium, then bismuth, then tellurium, and chlorine is the largest. And we find that the actual data confirms it. Actinium has the smallest ionization energy at 499 kilojoules per mole, and chlorine is the largest at 1251.2 kilojoules per mole. One thing to notice is that we've been talking about taking one electron away from an atom. But except for hydrogen, all the elements have more than one electron for each atom. So, for example, we can take an electron away from sodium, which will give us a sodium plus ion. We can write this as though it's a normal chemical reaction. If we do, we have a sodium atom as the reactant, and the products are the sodium plus ion and the electron that we remove. The ionization energy for that reaction is 495.8 kilojoules per mole. But a sodium atom has a total of 11 electrons, so there's no reason we can't take away a second electron now. If we do, think about what the chemical reaction will be. We're starting with the sodium plus ion we've already made, and if we take away a second electron, we get a sodium plus 2 ion as the product, along with the electron we take away. Would you expect the ionization energy here to be higher or lower than it was in the first reaction? Well, remember, we're starting with a sodium plus ion, so it already has a positive charge. It'll be much harder to take away an electron from this ion than it was to take an electron away from the original atom, which was neutral. So we expect the ionization energy will be higher, and this is the case. It takes 4,562 kilojoules per mole to take away the second electron. And to take away a third electron is even harder. It'll take 6,910.3 kilojoules per mole. Each of these energies has a different name. The energy it takes to remove the first electron is called the first ionization energy, and the second is called the second ionization energy, and so on. In principle, you can take away all the electrons in an atom, and each one would have a higher ionization energy than the one before it. So where does this come up? It turns out that some very common lasers use atoms that have been ionized. For example, ions of krypton plus and argon plus are in lasers that have lots of different applications, including LASIK eye surgery, laser light shows, and security holograms like the ones you sometimes see on expensive packages of electronic equipment or on credit cards. And the energy it takes to form the ions used in these lasers is determined by the ionization energy. So, for example, the energy it takes to form an argon plus ion is its ionization energy, 1520.6 kilojoules per mole. The third property I want to tell you about is the electron affinity. This is kind of the opposite of the ionization energy. Instead of the energy it takes to remove an electron, it's the energy it takes to add an electron. So, if we start with a neutral atom, we're making a negative ion by adding an electron. So, for example, if we start with an oxygen atom, we can add an electron to form an oxygen minus ion. In this case, the electron affinity is negative 141.0 kilojoules per mole. Notice it's a negative number, which means that this is an exothermic reaction, so it actually releases energy. That tells us that the oxygen minus ion is actually more stable than the plain oxygen atom. And this is true. You rarely see just a plain oxygen atom in nature, but oxygen minus ions are much more common. Just as we could remove more than one electron from an atom, it's also possible to add more than one electron. So, for example, the chemical reaction where we add an electron to a phosphorus atom is this one. We have the atom as a reactant, and the electron we want to add is another reactant. The product we get is a phosphorus minus ion. We're adding an electron, so the energy of this reaction is the electron affinity, which is negative 72.0 kilojoules per mole. 
if we add a second electron, we have a different chemical reaction. This time, we're starting with the phosphorus minus ion and an electron, and we get a phosphorus 2 minus ion as the product. The electron affinity is positive 468 kilojoules per mole, so this time it's an endothermic reaction. We have to put energy in in order to make the reaction happen. This makes sense. We started with a negatively charged ion, so it repels other negative charges, like the one on the electron we add. This makes the reaction much harder than the first one. We could continue this process by adding another electron, which would give us this reaction, which has an electron affinity of positive 886 kilojoules per mole. Just as with the ionization energy, each of these energies has a different name. The first one is called the first electron affinity, the next is the second electron affinity, and so on, and each one has a higher energy than the one before it. One thing to notice is that by adding or taking away electrons, we can end up with the same number of electrons for different elements. For example, suppose we have a calcium atom. As you can see from the periodic table, calcium has 20 electrons. Meanwhile, potassium has 19 electrons, but we can make a potassium with 20 electrons if we add one, which gives us a K minus ion. Meanwhile, scandium has 21 electrons. We can make a scandium with 20 electrons by taking away an electron, which gives us a scandium plus ion. As you can imagine, we can make ions of any element that would have the same number of electrons, although for some of these, it would be extremely unlikely. So for example, we could in principle make argon minus 2, carbon minus 14, tin plus 30, or uranium plus 72, all of which would have 20 electrons, the same as a neutral calcium atom. Atoms and ions like these, which have the same number of electrons, are said to be isoelectronic. Well, that's enough for now. Next time we'll talk about the electronegativity, which is the last of the properties that are influenced by the effective nuclear charge, and we'll see that it has a big impact on the structure of molecules. So until I see you next time, have a good week.